Hello, everyone, and welcome to the IRIF Algorithms and Complexity Seminar. Today's speaker uh, is uh, going to be David Sopik, and he's going to tell us something about uh, a new corset framework for clustering. Uh, the idea is to have uh, like a 40, 45 minutes talk, followed by some questions, which will not be recorded. Uh, so yeah, I guess David, I don't know if they can interrupt you in the middle of the talk or, or what's the plan? Yeah, of course. Okay, so yeah, people are encouraged to interrupt David in, uh, in the middle of the talk. Uh, don't leave any, uh, anything unclear. Uh, okay, so with that said, uh, David, the, the stage is yours and I'm going to let you uh, tell us about your work. Well, thank you for the introduction. So I'm going to present to talk about core sets for clustering. Core set is some, you can think of it as data compression uh, procedure. And clustering is you have a big data set and you want to extract some information about it. Uh, this is a joint work with Vincent Coenadad, my advisor, and Chris Spiegelson from Aarhus University in Denmark. And this will appear uh, this year at stuff. Oops. Sorry. Okay. So the clustering uh, problem we're going to look at in this talk are center-based, which means that so the input is a set of points in some metric space, uh, and there's a positive integer z, and the objective consists of finding a set of k center such as to minimize uh, the sum of distances from every point to its closest center raised to the power z. So you just want to find uh, k points, such, that, such as to minimize the distances to the z to those k points. OK, so this definition encapsulates some standard uh, clustering objectives, such as k median. If you take z equals 1, the cost function is just minimize the sum of distances from any point to its closest center. So these objectives, you can think of it as uh, minimizing the average distance to any point in expectation. So if, 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 you're, if you're taking one, one input point uniformly at random and pay the distance, your cost is the distance to that, that point, in expectation, you're going to have uh, to pay sum of distances to any point times the probability, which is a constant. So it's just minimizing the average distance to any point. And this is kind of uh, a postman problem where you you have some package to deliver at a uniform random uh, position. Okay. When it's not average, but worst case, the problem is k-center. In our definition, it's uh, the limit when z goes to infinity. You don't want to minimize the average distance, but the maximum distance this models uh, the building of a uh, fire station. Uh, you, you don't want to be on average close to everyone. You want to be close to everyone because when a fire starts, you need to be fast. Okay, so that's some justification for the objective. But it also encapsulates the classic uh, k-means problem where z equals two. And so the goal is to minimize the sum of distances square to the closest point. Okay, in this talk, so, so our results encapsulate works for any Z, but we're going to, you, you can think of it as Z equals one, and we just want to minimize the sum of distances. Okay, and the question, so I said corset was some data compression tool, or sketch. Question is how many points are necessary to represent a data set? So if the data set is not completely random, such as this one, then you, you can take, so you have a clear structure here. If you want to represent the data set with few points, you can take uh, some of them here, maybe some of them in that cluster as well, here as well, and here, and that will represent somewhat nicely the, the whole data set. So all points are not necessary in that case. On the other hand, if the data set is completely random, then you can just take some random sample of the data set. So I'm taking that point, that point, 
maybe that point, that point, that point, etc. And that would be representative as well. So we don't need the, to keep the whole data set to be representative. And that's what core sets formalize. OK, so more precisely, what is a core set? So it's a set, what we call a core set is a, a subset omega of the input that such that if you evaluate the cost of any solution to, uh, for the set omega, it has roughly the same cost as for the full data set. So more precisely, you are, you are given a set of points A. And we say that a so weighted subset omega is a core set if for, so, OK. For instance, those four points, we say it's a core set if for any set S of K center, for instance, I'm picking those two centers, it holds that the cost of green, the input points to S, so the sum of distances to the blue points, is roughly equal to the one of the core set point, which is this point. Here, the distances are weighted. So I'm, I'm paying four times this distance, two times this distance, two times this one, etc. And if, so the weighted cost of omega is roughly equal to the weighted cost of A, which is formalized by this equation, then omega is a core set. If it holds for any solution S. So if I'm, instead of those two points, I'm taking those two, then the sum of distances to of green points to those two points have to be equal to the sum of the core set points, uh, this distance to the, the blue point. Okay, so that's the object we're going to study. Question? Yeah, so we want to find a small subset of the data input that allows to approximate, to compute approximately the cost of any given solution uh, S. Is this clear? Do you have questions yet? Yeah, maybe one question. So are you considering uh, only Euclidean spaces? No. So this can be in any, any metric space. And can you create new points, like the red points? Do they have to? Oh, it's a subset. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. So in our case, we, we focus on subsets. Omega has to be a subset of the input. Okay. Just a naive, uh, a naive question. Um, does uh, does the sum of the weights have to be equal to the number of points at the time, or is this completely uh, applied by the model, or is it sometimes not the case? It has to be roughly equal. So you, you since you have an epsilon error uh, ah, yeah. here, okay. you may have also an epsilon error in the weights, but you, maybe you think of it as the sum of weight is the number of points. Yeah, okay, okay. And in this first case, it's going to be the, the case. We're going to weight points exactly such as the sum of weight is equal to the number of input points. Okay. Which is maybe not the case in the example I drew, but okay. No, he, he, I think it is. Um, yeah. Good. Okay. So the algorithmic goal uh, of our paper is to so construct a core set with as few points as possible, we want to find a, a very sparse representation of our input. We want to build it as fast as possible and ideally as simple as possible. So that's ideal goal, uh, quite standard for, from an algorithmic perspective. Okay, so let me highlight the state of the art. So this huge picture is just to show that there's, it's a vivid area and maybe let me highlight two, three results. So the first one uh, that introduced the core sets uh, notion is from Harper and Mazumdar. It was back in the time where the dimension was small, so they can be expansion in the dimension D. For, for uh, sorry, on this slide, I'm focusing on, on Euclidean uh, spaces. Okay, so the dimension is small until K Chen introduced some sampling techniques to get linear uh, corset size linear in D and with the dependency log n. And we're going to explain roughly how this result works uh, later in the talk. And maybe the most interesting result is uh, this one. 
from Feldman and Lumberg uh, in 2011, uh, where they got rid of the number of input points. So that's super impressive to me. I'll explain it slightly more later. But it's also impressive because all those works are based on the feldman lumberg framework. Um, so, so, yeah, they really built a framework using some sampling techniques related to VC dimension. And then uh, for the next 10 years, people just tried to improve that framework. And our result is here. We present a new framework uh, to, to, to build core sets uh, in Euclidean spaces, but we claim that our result is versatile and we can apply it to many different uh, metric spaces. Well, so for instance, in finite metric spaces, we also improve on the feldman lumberg framework, doubling metrics. We improve on uh, Huang, Yang, Li, and Wu, who did themselves apply feldman lumberg framework, etc. So all the previous work were based on uh, Feldman Lumberg, and we managed to improve on all of them by something we hope to be simple and easy to apply. Maybe one measure of simplicity is the length of our article, which is like only 60 pages, compared to, but it's with those 60 pages, we improve on all the previous results on Corset that we know. Uh, and if you add up all those articles, it's like more than 200 pages. So it's a measure of simplicity. Uh, okay. So, okay. So why are course that important? That's my personal opinion. So structurally, structurally, I think it's really beautiful. So in the result I, I showed you here, for instance, the finite so from uh, Feynman and Lemberg, the size of the course that doesn't depend on n. So if I, if you want to solve, say, k means with k equals 10, what this says is that you, you only need to consider a hundred, few hundred points to approximate the cost of any possible solution. And those few hundred points, are, this quantity it doesn't depend how many points is the, in, are in the input. So maybe the input has size like 1 million, but still you need to consider 200 points to approximate the cost of any solution. If the input has size 1 billion instead, it's still 200 points. So whatever the size of the input, only a few hundred points are necessary to structure, structurally describe uh, what's going on with k-means. This is very, I mean, it's very impressive to me. You don't, it doesn't scale with the number of points at all. Completely Sorry. independent. But do you, are there some pathological cases where it would actually scale, or it's really like a universal statement for all metrics, for all sets of points? Uh, you only need a constant number of points. No. So for all metric, for all finite metric, you have it scales with log n. Okay. In Euclidean spaces, it doesn't depend on n at all. In the worst case. Okay, so I believe there's a question. And if the point set is continuous. Okay, I think that's so, a thousand question. So if the input space is continuous, um, then there, I believe there are some results where you want to cluster not points, but uh, hyperplanes or subspaces. So you want Instead of doing k-means on points, you're doing k-means on planes. So there are corsets for that, uh, but I don't know. I, I believe they work using the feldman lumberg framework, but we don't. Uh, we didn't dig into that yet. Ah no, you mean like a distribution of R to the G, for example. Did I did I answer the question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, if n is infinite, if n goes to infinity, 
your set of points becomes a, maybe a distribution over something. Since you said uh, it did not depend on the number of points, let's make it infinite. Okay, so the, at least the construction time depends on n. So maybe we cannot do it. Could you sample from this distribution then build a corset? That's not clear. Uh, maybe it depends on the distribution. If if so, we need to build a corset. We need to build a constant factor approximation to the to the input. So if the input is infinite, then yeah, it depends on the distribution. But if we can, if we can build a constant factor approximation, I believe we, we can do what Simon proposed. So sample from a distribution and then build a corset. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so go back on the slides. Okay, so this corset definition is like, oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> Uh, structurally, structurally impressive, and more pragmatically, it, it allows to speed up running times of algorithm. If you have a running time depending on n, then it depends only on omega plus the time to construct omega, which is fast, hopefully. It also applies to memory constraint setting. Since a, it's a data compression tool, then you can use it uh, or MPC algorithm, streaming, distributed computing. And I'll explain more streaming uh, in a few minutes. And uh, the existence of small corset uh, can be used in the analysis of other problems. Okay. So that's, in general, framework uh, corsets are important for those reasons. And our results, uh, specifically, improves the corset analysis in two ways. So we present a new and we claim easier to apply and simpler framework uh, than the one of Feldman Lemberg that allows to improve on all the bounds I, I showed you. And we canonize corset constructions to very uh, simple and structured inputs uh, that we will see as well in a few minutes. And so if you want to improve on all results, you just need to improve on those simple and structured uh, inputs. OK. So the plan of the remaining of the talk is, first, I'm going to show you how to apply corset for clustering in the streaming setting. Then uh, I'll give you the algorithm and sketch of proof for a very simple case. And then we'll talk briefly about how to generalize uh, the results. OK, any other question? Maybe not, because you OK. OK, so clustering in streams. So the streaming model is uh, memory constrained. The goal is to find, for instance, k-means, the k-means cost of a data set. But we cannot store the whole data set into memory. So we have only memory, say, k log n. Question is, what do we do? And for that, we're going to show how to construct a, a core set on the, on the fly. So reading what points one by one and constructing progressively a core set using two key properties. The first one is, if you have, a, if you have some data set and a core set of that data set, then a, another data set and a core set of it, then the union of the two core sets is a core set of the full input. OK, so that's formalized here. If omega 1 is a core set of A1, omega 2 a core set of A2, then the union of omega 1 and omega 2 is a core set of the full data set. OK, that's, yeah, that's a simple property. The second property is transitivity. So if you have an input A, and omega 1 is a core set of A. And then you say omega 2 here is a core set of omega 1. Then omega 2 will be a core set of A. Because omega, if you want to evaluate the cost of a solution in A, 
then it's roughly the same cost as in omega one, which is roughly the same cost as omega two. So omega two is also a corset of A. With a slightly worse than uh, dependence in epsilon. Okay. So how do you use those two properties in the streaming uh, model? So I'm going to show you some simple algorithm. There's probably better, but it's a simple illustration. For this, we're going we're going to have log n buckets, each having memory k. So each bucket can contain k points. The first bucket is just uh, reading the input. So it reads input until there are k points. When there are k points, we move them to the second bucket and delete them from, from the first bucket. Okay. Then k of a point, uh, I mean, new points arrive until there are k of them. When they are k, we need to move them as well to the second bucket. Erase them here. And now there are too many points in the in the second bucket. So we just take a core set of it. And we summarize those two k points into a one plus epsilon core set of size k. Okay. So now the, the, the whole input here is represented just by a core set there. And this can keep going on. New points arrive. They are moved to the first bucket. Deleted. New points arrive. It's so moved here. Now there are two k points here, so we also need to summarize them into a corset. So now what happens? Th this is a corset of the first part of the input. This one, so maybe call it omega 1. This one, omega 2, is a corset of the second part of the input. So the union of the two is a corset of the full input by the first property I showed you. Now, if I take a corset of the two by the transitivity property I showed you, it's going to be a corset of the full input. So I can remove omega 1, omega 2, and I have the, this full input is represented only by k points in that bucket. So I can do that iteratively, and I can keep read the stream on the fly and merge points progressively to corsets, and then take corset of corset. And at the end of the stream, I have an in memory k log n, k by bucket. And I can compute an approximate solution on what I have at the end, which is a corset. And that would give me a, an approximate solution for the initial for the stream, the full stream. Okay. So that's it. That's just a simple way of using the two properties, composability and transitivity, to use corset for streaming. Uh, the streaming model. Okay. Are there any questions? So here, if I understood correctly, your error at the end increases by uh, by a factor of log n, right? Okay. Yeah. So you need to scale epsilon by log n. So the memory is not k log n, but k log square n. Okay. And just wanted to hide that. But good catch. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So if there's no more question, I hope to have interest you interested to have taken your interest uh, enough to be able to show you some part of the proof. So remember that uh, one sec, I need to plug in my computer. Give me one one second. Oops, sorry. Hope you're still interested. So the what we want is to compute 
the corset omega. So corset omega is such that the cost with respect to any solution S in omega is roughly the same as the cost of A with respect to any solution S. OK. So this proof strategy will be as follows. First, we'll, we're going to find the distribution D such that if omega is uh, computed by simply sampling delta points from the distribution, then we have for any fixed solution that the cost is preserved. Instead of targeting directly the, uh, the property for all solutions, we just fix one and want to build a corset for one fixed solution. So I just want to preserve the cost of one solution S. And we want that with some huge probability that uh, we're going to describe. And then we want to apply a union bound of our all possible uh, set S. So that, okay, so that's the strategy. The union bound here can be tricky because there may be an infinite number of solution S. If we're in the Euclidean plane, there are infinitely many possible center locations. So S can be infinite. So we need to be smart uh, in the second bullet. Okay, so that's the proof strategy. And we're going to make some assumptions. So we focus on the case where k equals 1. So there's only one center. z equals 1, so we want to minimize the sum of distances to that center. We are in the plane, so that can be joins. And the input is very structured. There's only one ring here. So there's some uh, center here. The red point is some center. It will be called c uh, later on. And every point is a distance r of the center C, or maybe roughly R, not exactly, but roughly. So yeah, the input is very structured, very well structured. And we'll see in this, in this case how to build a corset. Okay. Actually, the algorithm is super simple. It's just sample delta points uniformly at random from the, this input, from the green points. And as, as Ulysse at the beginning, we want to preserve the mass of the corset, so we put weights n over delta to the delta sample point. So for instance, I'm picking this point, this point, and this point, and I'm weighting them n divided by 3, n divided by 3, and so that the total mass is still n. Okay, so that's the algorithm. We just pick delta points uniformly at random, and we place them, uh, place weight. Uh, equals to n divided by number of sample points. Okay, so why does that work? Okay, the next slide is the most technical part of the talk. Hopefully it's not too technical. I don't think it is. Uh, and hopefully I will keep your attention, but I just wanted to have a warning. Okay, so the first, so we have a fixed center S, and we want to say that something delta points uniformly at random just uh, preserves the cost of the solution S. Okay, so first we show that uh, it preserves the cost in expectation. That's the first thing to do. And for that, we just write the what it means, the expected cost. It's the, the cost is the sum of the distances to S weighted by uh, the weight. We use linearity of expectation. This is just the sum for all points of the weight times the distance times the probability of being sampled. And if I'm sampling delta points uniformly at random, this probability is delta divided by n. So it cancels out with the weight here. And it gives exactly what what remains is exactly cost of the solution a to solution uh, of the input set a to solution s okay so in expectation by our choice of weight uh, we are good we're in good shape now we want to bound the deviation to the expectation once we know the cost is preserved in expectation uh, 
uh, sorry, once we know that the cost is preserved in expectation, we want to say that with high probability, it will not move too far away from the expectation. For that, we use, and that's the technical part. So it's some basic concentration and inequality, maybe the most basic one, Hobbes inequality, that says that if you have some variables xi that are independent and all bounded between a and b, then their sum deviates to its expectation by x with probability exponentially small in x squared. OK. OK, so wh wh what do we want to take for variable xi? So we want, ideally, we, we'd like the sum of xi here to be equal to the weighted cost of omega 2s, so that the expectation is cost a s. And the deviation here is exactly what we want to bound. So to do that, we take xi to be the weighted cost of the if sample point. So, OK, so xi simply equals to n divided by delta times the distance of, uh, let, let's call it omega i to s. Yeah, so that the sum of the xi is exactly equal to the cost of uh, omega with respect to s. Its expectation is what we said earlier, the cost of a. And Hobbes inequality is, uh, means exactly that, that, that thing. Okay. So now we need to bound b minus a. What is the difference between the value of two, x, uh, two possible value for xi? So because our input is super structured, we have that property. So omega i is here. We know that it's a distance r to the center c. So if we use triangle inequality to s, the difference in costs can be at most r times the weight. The weight. Because the xi is n divided, n divided by delta times the distance from omega i to s. So this is at most n over delta times r plus this distance. So the max value minus the mean value for xi, which is b minus a, it's 2r times n divided by delta. That's the essentially the diameter of the input times the weight. OK, so in our equation, we replace means that our opting inequality becomes uh, this. And now we pick x. We take x equals to 2 epsilon and r. OK, I replace so that everything here cancels out. And at the end, we have that inequality. OK, so now what does this mean? So as we said, all points are at radius r from the center. So n times r is the cost of that solution. All points in the ring pays r to be clustered to C. So that's the cost of the optimal solution, n times r. And that's because our input is defined that way. Every point r at distance r from the optimal center. So n r is equal to opt, which is at most cost of a with respect to s, because the optimal cost is the smallest possible cost. So it's at most, uh, so cost a s is more than opt. Oops, so this drops. I'm missing. Okay. 
So the final inequality we have by just applying Hofding and replacing the values uh, with what it means in our setting is that the deviation, the cost deviation between omega, the, the corset on A, is bigger than 2 epsilon times the cost of A with probability exponentially small in the number of sample points delta. Can I ask a question? Uh, I missed something. So in, in the circle, what if not all the points are well distributed, but all the points are on the on the right? So, so you could have a center which is also on, on the right and not in the middle of the circle. Okay, so the center is defined to be the optimal solution. In, in okay. The, the structure of the input is that, oops, sorry, the optimal solution is the center of the circle. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. So it means that for a fixed solution S with probability uh, I dropped constants, but with probability one minus exponential minus epsilon squared times delta, uniform something works and provides the core set in our very structured inputs. OK, so now the technical part is over. So if you dropped, you can come back. And we need to do the union bound. And as I said, uh, OK, OK, no, sorry. A any other question uh, for the concentration bound? OK. OK, so we want to say, now we have for a fixed solution, uh, we constructed a corset. We want to say that it's it's also a corset for any solution. So for that, we want to use union bound. The issue is that there's infinitely many possible solutions. OK, so how do we discretize the Euclidean plane? Usually, we take a grid. And we managed to say that, OK, there's a finite grid, such that if I restrict the inputs only to the grid points, um, I'm somewhat happy. So that's what we'll, we'll try to do. The first thing to do is to bind the diameter of the grid. So we want to take a grid of bounded diameter that is finite. That is finite, and that would be enough uh, for our purpose. OK, so the first thing we do is, what if there's, what if S is super far away from C? So if it's a distance more than R divided by epsilon, from the perspective of S, then all those points, all those green points, are essentially at the same distance, at the same position. Because R is so small compared to the red distance that you can do, that they can be all points here can be represented by all other points because of triangle inequality. OK. So in that case, oops. Sorry. In that case, we just need the weight to be preserved so that every point can be represent, every green point of the original input is represented by someone else in the core set. And all something distribution. Uh, ensures exactly that because we weight the sample points by n divided by number of sample points. Sorry, so 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 that's that's enough. S is so far away that every point is at the same spot, so we just need to preserve the number of points. Okay, so that's the easy case. So now we can restrict ourselves. We just need to, to to look at the case where S is close to the optimal center C. And in that case, we can take a grid. And we take a grid of granularity epsilon r. So this is at most r divided by epsilon, maybe 2r divided by epsilon. And we say that the granularity here is epsilon r. 
So the number of intersection, the number of points in the grid is uh, two divided by epsilon square, which is finite. So we, if we manage to restrict to any grid point like G, we'd be happy. And uh, that's what we will do. We'll, we say that any point S can be represented by its closest grid point G. OK, so how do we do that? How do we formalize the union bound? So we let we choose the parameter delta, the number of sample points, to be epsilon to the minus 2 times log of the si two, si two sides of the grid. OK, so for fix the property we had, the, the property we have showed uh, earlier is that for fixed grid point, for any fixed grid point with probability equals to uh, 1 minus 1 divided by 2 number of grid points, the cost if, is preserved. So if we make a union bound of our all grid points, we have that with probability at least one half. For all grid points, the cost is preserved at the same time. OK. So now let S be any possible center. And we want to say that the cost for that center is preserved. Because here it's just grid points. It's not all points in the input. The first case is when S is very far away. This we have seen that this is the easy case. We just need to preserve the weight. So there's no, we don't even need a union bound lemma for that case. It's just done. OK. Now the harder case. So C is close to uh, S, the solution S that we're looking at is close to C. So we have a grid point very close to S. By definition of the grid, every, that there's a grid point at distance at most epsilon R. Then how can we express? So we want to relate the cost of S with res uh, the, the cost of A with respect to S to the cost of A with respect to G. Say that the cost of the solution S is roughly the cost of the grid point that's close by. And for that, we use triangle inequality. We just say that the cost of the distance from any point to S is at most distance from the point to G plus epsilon R, which is distance of S to G. OK. So epsilon R times the number of points is epsilon opt, because each point space R in opt. So we have that the cost of A with respect to S is at least at mo uh, most 1 plus epsilon times the cost of A with respect to G. So similarly, we, we can have exactly the same equation with omega instead of A. And we can have the same equation replacing S and G. So the cost of A with respect to G is roughly equal to the cost of A with respect to S. And so that allows us, oops, OK. I missed the slide. So that allows us here, uh, that allows to use this equation, since we have for all G, the cost is preserved. It's also preserved for all S, because the cost of S is the same. So we can we can use the union bound, extend the union bound from the grid to the whole infinite metric space. OK, that's it for the proof. If you have any question before going to the, very briefly to the generalization, uh, let me know. OK, maybe I can ask one question. So the, the number of uh, squares in the grid is uh, like power two because you're in dimension two, but like in more in a higher dimension, maybe the, you need more points in the grid. And so maybe you need like bigger, smaller epsilon, I don't know. And are okay. you going to have like a de dependency on the, on the dimension in the number of points or in epsilon or something? Okay, good. So the, in the dimension D, we have 
side of, of the grid will be approximately 1 over epsilon to the d. But delta is log of g of the size of the grid. So delta is the number of sample points. So delta will be linear in d. Approximately equal to that. OK. So we're, go we're going to be not expansion in the dimension, but linear. And then if you want to remove the dependence in d, there are some dimension reduction technique that says that if you are looking at corset objective, you can project into log k dimensions. So you can replace that d by a log k. But that's using prior works, and I'm not going to dive into, into it. OK, thanks. But, but without any tool, uh, oops, sorry, without any tool, since we have the, the dependency in the size of the grid is logarithmic, we have a linear dependency in D. OK. OK, so if we want to remove the restrictions, so the points are not in a circle. They are arbitrary around their optimal solution. Uh, and they're maybe not in the plane, but not in the plane. I just said how to change uh, our proof. What do we do? So instead of having just one, one ring, there may be log n rings around each optimal center. That means k log n rings. And in our analysis, we need to sample delta points from every ring. So the, the total size would be k square log n times d, if we're in dimension d. So that's the first hurdle of the of the proof. So what I, I showed you before is essentially k chain proof, the proof that dates back from 2009. And what we managed to do is to have fewer rings. So first, we remove the far ring. We, we have a preprocessing that says that if a ring is very far, so all those points that are very far from the optimal center. So we have a pre algorithmic preprocessing step to say we're not going to sample points from that ring. And the second, uh, okay, the second idea we have is to instead of considering rings independently around each cluster, around each center, as I said in the, as I did in the proof, we're going to look at all the rings at the same distance from their center at the same time. So this ring will be considered at the same part of the analysis as this one and as this one. And we can show that instead of something delta points in each ring, we can sample delta points in all of them and have the same guarantee. So that we move one factor k. OK, so we merge the ring in the analysis and we remove the far rings by a careful preprocessing. OK, and so to go beyond, lastly, we need to go beyond R2, even R to the D. So the only place where we needed Euclidean space here was for the union bound part. And so that's the only thing. If, if we want to use the, this framework in another metric space, we just need to show how to do the union bound and adapt that grid argument to other metric spaces. And we managed to, show, to, to do it into, uh, for some spaces that have small separators, like planar graphs or bounded tree with graphs. Maybe it does work for other metric spaces. That's an open question. OK. So as a conclusion, we give a new and hopefully simple to understand framework. Uh, so, so hopefully simple to use. We do improve on all state of the art corset bounds for uh, K clustering. Right, so that's our result. And maybe some open problems uh, for the end.
could you apply the framework to other metrics than the one I mentioned or to other problems? Maybe the problem I mentioned uh, to answer Claire, Claire's question about uh, clustering spaces instead of clustering points. Uh, could you have better, even better dependency for uh, k-means in R to the D, so in Euclidean spaces? Could you have something like k divided by epsilon square? And the question is, mm, hopefully yes. Hopefully we did solve it with Casper Green Larson uh, as a co-author. We may have a both a lower bound and an upper bound uh, matching for k-means in Euclidean spaces. And for higher powers, instead of having epsilon to the z, could you have something like k divided by some power of epsilon times a function of z, uh, separate the dependency between epsilon and z? Would that be possible? OK, so that's it. Thank you. Can write it. Thank you.